In the last video, I covered gas mantles, which were a major improvement to open flame style gas lighting, and they started to replace street lights in the 1890s. You can still find some examples today, including Coleman camping lanterns, which are still using gas mantles even in 2020. From what I can tell, there are two differences between the gas mantles used by Coleman in their lanterns and the gas mantles used in street lights today. The one is that Coleman appears to be using using yttrium as the material for the gas mantle and most of the street lights probably use zirconium but it's hard to tell exactly how many are using which material and the second is that these are powered by propane while the street lights are usually using natural gas at this point but regardless purchasing this propane lantern allowed me to get some hands-on time with the technology and measure it so that we can see how it stacks up compared to modern light sources the first thing i want to look into is the spectrum or spectral power distribution of the light this is showing you the relative intensity of each color that's produced. And you can see that it follows a very similar pattern to incandescent, where right around 400 nanometers, which would be the transition point between ultraviolet and purple light, there is very little light. And then as you go up toward red and infrared, there's more and more light. This is almost identical to incandescent. If you compare them to other light sources, you can see that they're right in the range of warm white LED lighting and halogen lighting, but closer to incandescent overall. And if you compare it to open flame gas lighting, which I covered in one of the previous videos, you can see that there's relatively more blue light and the spectrum is overall higher than the open flame style gas lighting. Now I want to note that I measured the light source at both a high and a low brightness setting so you can see the low brightness setting spectrum here. I think the perfect place to go from talking about the spectrum is a relatively modern metric called the spectral G index. It's starting to be used to refer to the amount of blue light that's produced by a light source. Blue light is important for one because it can potentially disrupt human circadian rhythms, our sleep cycle or body clock. And it's also potentially been shown to interrupt ecological patterns so that the more blue light that we're producing, the more potentially damaging to environmental patterns such as bird migration patterns there might be. To give you a feel for the spectral G index, it goes from about zero to three, roughly speaking, and something in the range of zero to one is going to have a relatively high amount of blue, while something that's in the high twos or above will have a relatively low amount of blue. And for the gas mantle lighting, the spectral G index fell basically right in the middle. I got for the low brightness setting 1.53 and for the high brightness setting 1.48. This is almost identical to incandescent lighting, which also falls right in the middle at around 1.41. Now, halogen lighting, which has a little bit more blue light than incandescent or these gas mantles, has a spectral G index of 1.16, while the open flame gas lamps that we tested previously have a spectral G index of 2.2, so they are quite a bit lower in blue light overall. Another thing to consider is that the gas mantles tend to be quite a bit brighter than the open flame gas lights. So in terms of ecological impact due to light pollution or light's effect on the environment, these do have quite a bit more of an impact, although compared to modern sources, they still are relatively dim. So let's talk about color quality. There are a number of metrics we use today to refer to our light sources quality of light. One of the most popular is CRI, the color rendering index. Now CRI has been around for a while and it's probably not the best color rendering metric, but more people are familiar with CRI than any of the other metrics, so it's still often stated. And the CRI for the gas mantles I got was between 97.3 and 97.6, depending on the setting. So this is a very high color quality light source. Now the thing about CRI is that the color samples used are relatively neutral, pastel, unsaturated colors, and they don't really talk about the strong colors produced by a light source. The reason for this is that CRI was basically intended to make fluorescent lighting look good, and fluorescent lighting tends to be pretty unsaturated in many colors. So additional metrics were added as a supplement to CRI over time, and one of the most 
commonly talked about metrics is R9. It's the strong red color rendering index. There have been a number of experiments that have shown that people in general tend to prefer lighting that has more red in it. And the issue with CRI uh, is that it doesn't account for a strong red. And a lot of fluorescent lighting in particular didn't have very strong red color rendering. And we're seeing the same thing repeat itself with LED where a lot of LED sources don't have very strong red color rendering. So the R9 metric was introduced specifically to talk about strong red color rendering as a supplement to CRI. And the R9 is very high for these gas mantles. I got 90 at the low setting and 93.2 at the high setting. There's a new color rendering system called TM30 and I hope that this will eventually replace CRI because it uses a much better sampling method which gives you a much more accurate picture of how the light source is performing. And one of the things that it includes is strong red in addition to a number of other strong color samples. So it not only takes into account the pastel color samples but also very strong color samples. So to put that in context, some light sources that had a high CRI also have a high TM30 RF value, but sometimes they don't. And especially as you get into the lower CRI values, sometimes the TM30 value can get even worse. So it shows you how bad some of these light sources actually are. But TM30 does rank the gas mantles very highly. I measured an RF of greater than 96 at both brightness settings. So that's showing you that the color rendition properties of gas mantles are very good. And finally, I want to talk about flicker. Flicker refers to the flashing of lighting. Sometimes it's actually visible, but a lot of times it's invisible. You can't even see it, but it's still flashing a little bit faster than your eyes can perceive. The problem with this is that not only can it cause visual problems such as eye strain, but it can also contribute to things like headaches and loss in concentration. To put flicker into the modern perspective, let's talk about fluorescent lighting. A lot of people complained about things like headaches and eye strain under fluorescent office lights, and it was found that one of the main reasons for this was the speed that the light was flashing. You couldn't usually see it, but it was flashing just a little bit faster than you could perceive. This was actually fixed with the introduction of electronic ballast, which flashed the light so fast that not only could you not see it, but it was most likely imperceivable from a biological perspective, so it wasn't causing things like headaches and eye strain. This actually became a problem again with the introduction of LEDs. The reason for this is that a lot of people involved in the manufacture and design of LED lighting had no prior experience in lighting, so they weren't familiar with the issue of flicker, and they would just design and manufacture LEDs so that you couldn't see the flashing, but it was actually still there. And this issue persists to this day because if you make LEDs that flicker, they tend to be cheaper than LEDs that do not flicker. It's also interesting to look at flicker in the context of lighting developments from the 1800s because they transitioned from open flames to more steady sources of light, such as incandescent gas mantles and incandescent electric lighting. Thomas Edison even said that in the future, only rich people would burn candles. Today we tend to have a very positive association with flickering flames, even though we probably wouldn't use them as our primary light sources. But in the 1800s, the transition to brighter, steadier light must have been a huge deal. So like any lighting nerd with the right tools, I went ahead and measured the gas mantles to see how they stack up. I got that the flicker percent was between 2 and 3%, which is a very low score. I also got that the frequency was between 2 and 4 hertz. And in my experience looking at the light, the light was relatively constant. If you looked closely, it would fluctuate a little bit every few seconds, but it was nothing like the open flame gas lamps that were visibly flickering multiple times per second. And finally, I want to get into the efficiency of the gas mantle lights. I did cover this in the main video, but I wanted to add a little bit more context. And this is actually one of the reasons that I think that gas mantles really took off. You see, Gas mantles are not only brighter and whiter than open flame gas lamps, but they're also more efficient. From what I could gather, 
Gas mantles were about twice as efficient as open flame gas lamps, using about two lumens per watt instead of one lumen per watt for the open flame variety. Now, this was probably a huge reason for the adoption of gas mantles at the time, because not only were they brighter and whiter, but they were also way more efficient, so it made more economic sense to light up cities with these light sources. Now, you might look at modern light sources and say, well, two lumens per watt is really inefficient compared to things like LEDs that can push over 100 lumens per watt. And you'd be totally right. And you might also look at the efficiency of modern incandescents, which are at least five lumens per watt. So you might be thinking, why would they have even considered gas mantles at the time when even incandescents are more efficient. The main thing I was able to gather was that incandescents weren't actually that efficient in the beginning. They weren't even close to five lumens per watt. They were more like two lumens per watt. So when you had an existing network of gas lighting, and all you had to do was make some minor adjustments to it to upgrade to this brighter, more efficient light source versus incandescent, which wasn't any more efficient, and you had to make all of these infrastructure changes to adopt it, it's pretty easy to see why gas mantles took off. Now, of course, incandescents did get more efficient over time, and that's one of the reasons that they ended up mostly replacing gas mantles in addition to other electric lighting technologies. But you can see that the advantage wasn't so clear cut at the time. The other thing is that early incandescents really didn't have a good lifespan, and other than general maintenance, a gas mantle itself could have lasted a lot longer than an early incandescent light bulb. So you could really see why this technology took off instead of incandescent, but over time, electric lighting technologies did get a lot better, and then they eventually almost completely replaced gas mantles. So I hope you like this technical overview of gas mantles. I know it's a lot, and I'm happy to answer any questions if there was something that was unclear. Um, but I would say that I'm trying to do one kind of main overview video and one technical video for each technology to dive in. So if this is not really up your alley in the future, you can just watch the main videos and I'm totally happy with that. This one is more for the lighting nerds or people who want to get a better understanding of how these light sources measure up in a modern context. I think all the rest of the videos in the series will be about electric lighting, but if there is something you want me to cover, please let me know and I can always consider it. So thanks so much for watching and I hope you have a great day.